Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Welcome, welcome. We are live uh, from Books and Books right here in the cultural heart of Coral Gables. We're very happy to have you with us this evening. Please check out our Books and Books uh, newsletter. This will give you a synopsis of all the wonderful events we have at Books and Books every night of the week. Uh, we have Spanish events, we have kids' events, poetry readings, first time authors, even celebrity signings. A couple of note I'd like to make mention of. Um, songer, uh, singer, songwriter Paul Williams will be here with his book uh, on Monday, uh, Gratitude and Trust, with co author Tracy Jackson. Uh, we have Anna Jet uh, Delgado will be joining us next week with a book that was written uh, mostly right here in the cafe at Books and Books. It's called The Clairvoyant of Calle Ocho. She'll be joining us as well. We've got Martin Amos uh, next weekend, or the 26th, um, with his book, Zone of Interest. We have tickets on sale for that as well. So pick up a copy of this newsletter, or you can go to our website at booksandbooks.com. Give us your email address so you don't miss anything. We can alert you to everything that goes on here at the bookstore. And as you will see by the lights and cameras throughout the uh, room here tonight, we do live stream a great majority of our events here uh, at the bookstore. Um, so anywhere you are in the world with access to the internet, uh, you can always watch the event and you can call the store during the event and get a book signed by the author or even uh, ask a question of the author. And I will just warn you though, for the uh, benefit of those who may be watching on the internet and see the audience here, just make sure you're sitting next to who you're supposed to be sitting next to. I will also remind you that uh, flash photography interferes with the uh, live stream, so um, uh, please refrain from that. So um, tonight we are very happy to have with us uh, Howard and Ellen Goodman and their new book, Disoriented. But to officially introduce our authors this evening as their friend and colleague, please welcome a good friend of Books and Books as well, Mr. Chauncey May. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to be at Books and Books uh, for, for any, any reason, especially to do an introduction. But this is a special pleasure because uh, Howard is an old newspaper man, like I am, although neither one of us are all that old. Um, but I'll never forget the way I first met Howard. He was working in um, the Palm Beach office of the Sun Sentinel. He was a, a Metro columnist. And this was back, uh, you know, 10 or 12 years ago, 15 years ago, when newspapers were still still doing pretty pretty good. We knew it was going downhill, but we thought we had 20 or 30 years, at least I did. Uh, so I would read the newspaper every day. And I noticed that this Metro columnist in the, in the Palm Beaches was pretty good, you know? <laughs> he was writing pretty good columns. So I sent him an email. I said, Howard, I really enjoy your columns. And he emailed me back, and that's how we became friends, because we didn't work in the same office. Um, and after a time, uh, he did move to the main office in Fort Lauderdale um, because things started to go bad really fast with the advent of, um, I blame Google, uh, with the advent of Google and, and the um, demise of, um, of the um, uh, classified ads in the newspaper. So Howard was reassigned uh, and given special training to become um, a, a sort of a coach. Yeah, blogs editor, but he was coaching me uh, on how to write a blog, and I couldn't get it. You know, I've been writing a certain way my whole life, and and I I just couldn't get it. I got it now, <laughs> you know, <laughs> ten years too late. But I couldn't get it then. But Howard was one of the most versatile and flexible journalists that I've ever known because he was offered this challenge: we're taking away the job that you love, but you can have this job. And as far as I could tell, he didn't spend a moment worrying about it or feeling bad about it. He just embraced the new challenge. Um, and then eventually, his, that job was phased out. And Howard, like, the rest, like a lot of the rest of us, eventually was unceremoniously uh, shown the door. Um, but Howard, again, spent less time mourning what he had lost and more time and energy um, seeking what he could do next. And one of the things that he was able to do next was, to my astonishment, find a, a job, um, a year-long job in uh, Shanghai, China, which is the subject of this book that he's written with his lovely and accomplished wife, Ellen. But I think Howard will be happy to hear that I have uh, um, so much come on to the uh, technical side of things now that I have notes on my uh, on my smartphone. <laughs> you know, this is a really good crowd for uh, a debut book. I'm really pleased to see it because I've seen only a handful of uh, people here for um, a Pulitzer Prize winner. You know, I was thinking about that line. I thought, wait a minute, Howard's a Pulitzer Prize winner. 
Howard got his start uh, in Philadelphia at the Enquirer, where he um, won a Pulitzer Prize as part of a, a team uh, doing investigative reporting. And then, of course, he came to the U.S. I mean, came to the U.S. He came to uh, uh, Fort Lauderdale and was the, was the uh, Metro columnist and uh, some other things that I've already told you about. Um, and he's just a really good writer, you know. You don't have to be a good writer to be a newspaper man. You just have to be competent. Howard is much more than that. Um, Ellen and Howard have um, a really great uh, personal story, too. They met in high school, and then they didn't see each other for 20 years. And, um, and then they reconnected in Philadelphia 20 years later and married and have three children? Three children? Yeah. Um, that's one of the two most romantic newspaper love stories that I know <laughs> of. And my friends from Fort Lauderdale will know what the other one is. Um, uh, Ellen, is a, is, um, Ellen is an educator and a businesswoman. Uh, she taught for 18 years, uh, mainly in special education. Uh, she's a creative problem solver, which means that she gets along well with Howard, since he's one of those two. Um, but to, uh, to tell you about their adventures in China and their new book, I give you Ellen and Howard Goodman. Thank you. Let me give Ellen the mic. Well, thank you for that really warm welcome, Chauncey. And Yes, I am amazed that you could use your uh, iPhone after um, uh, all those hours of blog uh, uh, lessons we tried. But this is, uh, this is really wonderful. Uh, seeing all of you here is, is just great because it's uh, really exactly uh, what I had in mind when uh, we started writing this book, that we'd have the chance to talk to lots of people in the States about what we saw in China. Uh, the book actually had its start as a blog, which made perfect sense because I had just recently been the blog's editor at the Sun Sentinel. And before that, I'd been a Sun Sentinel Metro columnist. So I was used to the rhythm of sitting down every other day and writing something and sharing it with an audience. It had become, a, it had become normal to think of, uh, that my thoughts and experiences had a, had a public audience. And what Ellen and I were seeing in China was so interesting, so new and different and bewildering and comical and disquieting. It was so invigorating to feel that we'd been injected into the wider world, that we were now in that roaming army of people who choose to live outside their own countries and embrace the whole globe. I felt like we'd hurled ourselves into a world of wider horizons, endless interconnections, unfamiliar cultures and histories, various grades of modernity. I wanted to tell it all. I wanted all the people I knew back home to know everything we were seeing and thinking, because I knew that very few people would have the chance that we were having. Uh, we could see very quickly that we were witness to something very important, the great rise of the world's most populous nation, uh, which was turning into something uncomfortable for America, a rival coming out of nowhere, fast. And I had a great perch from which to witness it, a newsroom that had a broad curiosity about all sorts of things, great and small, political, cultural, and personal, happening in this enormous and enormously interesting place. But of course, this adventure did not arise out of happy circumstances. It was 2009. Here in the US, the, US, the recession was hitting hard. I lost my job on the Sun Sentinel. The newspaper industry was, its, was shrinking. My chances of finding other work were very discouraging. The real estate market was collapsing, so Ellen's income was dropping too. So for the two of us, it was pretty scary. And then out of the blue came this opportunity to work at an English language newspaper in Shanghai. And we looked at each other and said, why not? <laughs> then our youngest was out of the house at college. And would you believe studying Mandarin? <laughs> so we rejoiced in the prospect of starting somewhere fresh and making it a family project. So off we went. And we had the exhilaration of wonderful new experiences, sights, smells, ideas. 
we got to keep our professional skills sharp and use them in new ways. But all the while, real life was breathing hard down our necks. We ended up losing our house in Delray Beach in a short sale. Our parents were in increasingly poor health. Uh, even when we returned after a year in Shanghai and a year in Hong Kong, uh, we had no guarantee of an income and no clear idea of what we'd do next. All that's part of the story, and we put it all in the book. And with that, I'll turn the mic over to Elle. And after that, we'll read some bits from the book and take any questions. Um, thank you very much for coming out. Appreciate that. A lot of our friends have come from uh, Palm Beach County, and I know it's not an easy, easy place to get to from here, but appreciate that. Um, I was teasing Howie on the way down. I said, I feel like it, I'm getting ready for my bat mitzvah, but <laughs> no Hebrew required, so that's always good. Heads up, my grandson, Logan. This is what you'll feel like. Um, our book is written in two voices. Howard's the writer in the family. There's never been a question about that. He was a writer when I met him in high school. He was the, already the editor of the school newspaper. And those of you that know me know that I am pretty comfortable speaking, <laughs> but I have a writer's block, always have. Um, I just found it pretty impossible to get, to go from here to the, the written page. And I've, I've avoided it, even though I was an English literature teacher and English teacher for many years. Uh, <laughs> I couldn't seem to get it myself. I couldn't put the writing down. Um, so when we first went to China, I'd come home with these amazing tales. Howard would be at the newsroom all day, and I would be out and about in Shanghai and then Hong Kong. And I'd say, you're not going to believe what happened to me. And I'd say, you need to write this down. And I would tell him these stories. He says, no, El. You need to write it down. Well, this, this, this could not become a secret. It had to come out. It couldn't be a secret what I wanted to share. So I started out first by pretending that I had a friend on the phone and telling them what, you're not going to believe what happened, and, and telling them. And I was able to break the block by taking my, phone, my imaginary phone conversation into uh, writing. And that became part of the blogs. This is, is two voices, a, an experienced journalist and me, <laughs> whatever that means. And um, quickly, uh, after the blogs came out, I was getting a lot of positive reinforcement. Oh, you're so funny, blah, blah, blah. And I thought, oh, this is, this is great. So I, I suggest to anybody that has, suffers with a writer's block, go to China. <laughs> There will be so much there that you want to share in the written word that that's what's going to happen. So while, while Howard was writing in at the, every day at the paper, there I was on my own. Nobody else on, in Asia that I knew. So I, I tried to make a life for myself. Before I was a realtor, I was a school teacher, as Chauncey mentioned, special ed. So I took my special ed training. And uh, I got some really interesting teaching assignments. My most interesting teaching assignment was working for Polyang Kuk, which is sort of, I guess you would say, the United Way of Hong Kong. They would, large companies would, would support them, and they had lots of different uh, charities that they were responsible for. One of them was sending out sc school teachers into housing projects in the, the outskirts of Hong Kong to try to get these, these children that lived in um, group homes. They were like foster homes for children who were removed from the homes because the, they, the, the families were having problems, drug, alcohol, families were in prison, whatever. This Hong Kong, Hong Kong. I did teach in, I teach in Shanghai, but the Hong Kong was the, um, the, the group homes. And so I would find myself getting on subways and all sorts of public transportation and getting myself over to um, housing projects in Kowloon and, and the outskirts. So I want to read to you a little bit about, in the book, about 
what it's like to teach in a Hong Kong housing project. Now, uh, what you need to know is, when I was in my early 20s, I went to the University of Illinois in Chicago, and I had a girlfriend there that lived in the housing project. So I had some idea of what one housing project in one city in one country was like. But as I soon learned, just because you think you know doesn't mean you really know it. This is a completely different experience. The Hong Kong housing projects weren't like the Chicago projects I'd seen many years ago. They're stairwells reeking of urine, bullet holes in the windows, people always watching out for rats and cockroaches. Hong Kong public housing was clean and well lit. The elevators were unthreatening. People on board didn't speak English, but they were always gave me a smile. Mothers would tell their little children, say hello, <laughs> trying to get them to practice their English. Kids were shy. So I'd start the communication by looking right at them and smiling. I'll say hello first, OK? Hello. And they'd laugh, and they'd say, hello. <laughs> then everyone in the elevator would laugh and smile, like it was the best joke they'd ever heard. I felt like a stand-up comic who had just killed. <laughs> the projects were large, concrete buildings without many windows. Unlike the subways, the projects were unair conditioned with just floor fans to move the warm, humid air around. I'd ring a bell or knock on the door and wait and hear, just a minute, just a minute, and there'd be the rattle of keys and locks. It sounded like a prison guard welcoming you Alcatraz. I got the feeling that security was important, not because crime was rampant. On the contrary, the, the projects felt very safe to me, but because the adults in the home were responsible for their kids, they couldn't risk any uh, runaways, so that was the reason for the, all of the locks and keys, which also meant that I was locked in, which was a little concerning if there had been a fire, but couldn't worry about every little thing. Um, without a, a set teaching curriculum, I was constantly on the lookout for interesting ways to get my students to converse with me. I had been given the assignment to get the kids, these Cantonese-speaking Hong Kong students, comfortable with spoken English. They all, they all study English in school, but without getting a chance to practice it, especially with a native speaker, it was very difficult. So that was my job. No, no curriculum, they said just get them to speak. If you can get them to speak English, you're doing a good job. Um, so I was constantly on the lookout for interesting ways to get my students to converse with me. One day, I brought in a Chinese celebrity magazine and played a version of who's hot, who's not. <laughs> I asked the girls to say who they thought was handsome and why. I was looking for some adjectives on that one. Uh, they pointed to the pictures of Asian pop stars, all bare faces and soft features, rather effeminate to my eye. They asked me if I agreed that the guys they had chosen were good looking. Um, no, I said. I preferred a different look. Well, who, who, they asked. Brad Pitt, I said. <laughs> um, oh, as if. <laughs> um, so, oh, I've lost my place, sorry. Um, I showed them the pictures of Brad Pitt, and they, they went, ew. I said, why ew? They didn't like the, the, the strong jaw and the big muscles. They preferred people that looked more like their sisters. <laughs> and, and I suddenly understood the craze of Michael Jackson in Asia. That's who the Chinese girls are looking for in a mate. Somebody that, that doesn't have uh, facial hair or you know, extreme muscles or strong jaw. They just wanted pretty, pretty men. And that is my first reading. Your turn. Hmm? That's the next. Hmm? Your turn to talk about Freckle? Next. Oh, okay. Your turn. <laughs> okay, well, since we're at the. Are you going to stand here and wait? Okay. Um, since we're at the center of literary culture for Florida, I thought I'd write something, read something about. Um, uh, my, my, my work at the newspaper in Shanghai on mainland China under rules of censorship. 
The Shanghai Daily jumped out at you from a Shanghai newsstand. Often it was the only publication in English. It was tabloid size, 40 pages every day, a decent roundup of city, world, and business news, sports, with a lot more stories about soccer and volleyball than the NFL and Major League Baseball, and features ranging from cosmetics tips and movie star gossip to advice on Chinese traditional medicine. The paper was a, quite a convincing copy of a Western newspaper, so long as you didn't depend on it for news of China. <laughs> the editors were a very smart group of people who knew quite a bit about the American and British media. Western journalists' standards, their frankness, the unflattering truths they often aired about China. The editors also clearly loved their jobs and knew the system they lived under, just as any long-surviving species knows its environment. They weren't going to punish, ver publish very much information about Xinhua. The state-run news agency had not released first. <clears throat> Everyone in the Shanghai Daily Newsroom had constant online access to the New York Times and The Guardian, meaning that everyone knew that when the subject was China, there was far more to the story than they were going to be able to tell in their own newspaper. The newsroom's TV screens were always showing CNN International, except for those moments when the screens would go blank, sometimes in mid-sentence. That's when some good bureaucrat in the Propaganda Bureau would have decided that the news report of the moment was too offensive for the citizens' eyes and ears, and CNN would suddenly disappear. This would reliably occur when the subject was the Dalai Lama, the Falun Gong, the Tiananmen Square message, Massacre of 1989, or a lot of other subjects, a lot more obvious. And as we all know from the last couple of weeks, it was going off the air all the time <laughs> with when those uh, Hong Kong demonstrations were going on. The Shanghai Daily had hired me to perform the strangest job I ever had in journalism, polisher. The job was needed because the reporters were Chinese and were attempting to write news stories uh, in English, their second language. It's quite an ama amazing ambition to put out a daily newspaper that's not in your natural language. And to realize it, the Shanghai Daily needed us. The dozen or so Australians, Canadians, Scots, Singaporeans, Indians, and the rare American to turn the reporter's tortured Chinglish, their word, <laughs> into publishable English. The job was part editing, part code breaking. We would read sentences like, he reminded Chang that Wei had complicated social intercourse. <laughs> we had to figure out that what the writer really meant was, Wei had disreputable friends. <laughs> we would read that a girl's right lung was punctuated, <laughs> and the price will be rescannable. We corrected those two, the lung was punctured and the price will be reasonable. We would read police stories that required a major case squad at the crack. The police, of course, spoke in Mandarin or Shanghainese, and it was up to our reporters to translate their statements into English. One day, I read this supposed quote from a police official. We will not notice them beforehand. No more face work and no more hideout. <laughs> I called the reporter over for an interrogation. It took, <laughs> took some questioning, but I determined that the official had said, we will not notify them beforehand, and we will do no more surveillance. <laughs> then there was the criminal defendant who was judged in guilty. The job would routine, routinely turn my brain into a knot. One of the veteran polishers had been collecting gems for years. There was this one. The minute you look up for haircut prices, young ladies dressed virtually in underwear would ejaculate a hot smile from the corners of their eyes. This was a piece about barber shops that provide additional services. Then there was, this is from a profile about a ping pong player, the Hercules heel lies in the mentality of the table tennis giant. Right idea, wrong God, right? Um, here's about a story about a man who's a golf course It went, Balls began to visit my home, as well as my neighbors. 
According to Yang, among the two women, a 24-year-old girl living there was in bad mood, as her mother, who went to have a bath with her, was dead during the accident. <laughs> then there was, quote, All I could do was lie in bed, beca becoming unconscious, even when going to piss, the 56-year-old <laughs> recalled. Two babies compete in a creeping match at Westgate Mall on Nanjing Road. This was a photo caption about an infant crawling contest. Um, and then we had the giant cock, which weighs over 50 kilograms, <laughs> needs five to six people to lift it. With its body and feathers in 10 colors, equipped with a sound system, the lantern can even crow as a real cock. <laughs> well, it was the year of the rooster. We polishers read this stuff with exasperation and hilarity. We worked mainly in silence, but every now and then you would hear a wild peal of laughter from someone like Sarah, an Australian, who had just read the words, ass glue. <laughs> it turned out the writer meant a product made from boiled donkey. There were the criminals who had been burst for stealing taxi meters. The capital of Haiti renamed as Port a Prison. The Folk Arts Museum, described as a village with humanistic flatus. <laughs> flatus, flatus, yeah. My friend on the features desk loved this bit of wisdom from a travel story about bat caves. For once, the English was crystal clear, if not quite ready for publication. Quote, when bat watching, it would be better if you wear a hat or cap, because the bats might dump shit on your head <laughs> when they feel disturbed. Oh, remember that the next time you travel to. My turn? Your turn. All right. Well, now you know what Howard was doing. He was polishing, and I was teaching. Uh, some of my students, I loved most of my kids, but some of them, as, as any teacher will tell you, some of them are real stinkers. Um, there was a girl that w talked about my skin. Uh, she was very attractive and self-possessed, um, a real rebel who would come in late and start talking just to disrupt the class. She made it clear she didn't care what my agenda was. The second or third time I met her, it was a warm night and I was wearing a sleeveless shirt dress. Um, she sat down and stared at me. Stared hard. Finally, she asked me a question. What is wrong with you? I said, what are you talking about? I asked. You know, she touched her forearm. What's wrong with your skin? There's nothing wrong, I told her. They're called freckles. She goes, you know, she said, all superior. There's something you can do for that. <laughs> she was referring to the creams that Asian girls use to whiten their skin. That's a beauty obsession, looking as white as possible. No stylish woman in China would ever intentionally get a tan. Yes, I understand, I said, but these are called freckles. They're very common in Western people. You may not believe this, but some people think it looks nice. Oh, no, really, she said. I started laughing. Yes, really. In fact, my husband actually thinks I'm attractive. Really? <laughs> Her tone was total disbelief, at which point, the other students jumped in. They knew that she had somehow crossed the line. Don't listen to her, they said. They pleaded. She doesn't know what she's talking about. I looked past her and just laughed at her. I said, yes, really. So that was one of my students. Now, I, I also had an adult student who happened to be a Chinese neighbor in my building in Hong Kong. I put up a little uh, post-it uh, native English speaker looking to uh, help tutor, call me. Um, so I, I had this man named John. He was in his, I guess, mid-30s, native Hong Kong man. Uh, he was married, had a wife and an adorable little, little child. We had met them at a uh, opening of a, a cafe down the street. And uh, I was happy when he called. I thought I'd get a chance to see the baby a little bit more. Um, John loved reading. 
and uh, I, I gave him the New Yorker, and, wanted, and he wanted to talk about the advertisements in the magazine. He was particularly interested in the ads for high-end watches. He wanted to know what brand of watch Howie wore. I'm not really sure what brand he wears. Is that important? Oh, John said, in Hong Kong, it's very important. You are judged by what you wear, and your watch lets people know your status. If you get a promotion, you're expected to get out and buy a complete new wardrobe, including a new watch. People expect it. Ah. Since moving to China, I had been struck by the prevalence of advertisements for luxury watches. The huge billboards for expensive timepieces were so prominent, I used them as landmarks to help me navigate my way around the town. When I saw Nicole Kidman in a sexy white gown with her diamond-studded watch sparkling on her wrist, I knew I was near my bus stop. Nicholas Cage was near the Times Square shopping center. Roger Federer and Megan Fox stood watch near our bank branch on Hennessy Road. Watch advertisements and jewelry stores showcasing watches were everywhere. Now I finally understood. It was a status thing. As for Hong Kongers and newly prosperous mainland Chinese who came shopping in Hong Kong, status was all important. Well, when I shared this story with my friend Angie Lau, a Canadian expat with ties to Hong Kong, she told me an amazing story. A friend of hers, a single career woman, had saved up her money to buy a designer purse. Their friend, her friend went to the flagship Louis Vuitton store in central Hong Kong, ready to spend about $3,000 US for the purse. When she entered the store, she was the only customer there. She looked around for a few minutes on her own, and then she was ready to speak to a clerk. But as hard as she tried, she couldn't make eye contact with either of the women behind the counter. They seemed to be avoiding her looking out the window as if she weren't there. Finally, a bus pulled up in front of the store and a group of Chinese women ran in. The clerks sprang to attention. One of the group went right up to the counter and studied the shelves. And in less than a minute, she pointed to the purses on the top row. And she said, I want them. She meant the entire shelf of purses. She bought them all. She was one of thousands of nouveau riche Chinese who flooded into Hong Kong every day from the mainland on special shopping junkets to buy things they couldn't get in their own town. Money was no object to them. She was there to purchase status. Which brings us to the experience that we're, we've been having personally watching what's going on in the news right now in Hong Kong. The places that we write about where we actually lived in Hong Kong are the places that are having all the protesters right now. Probably uh, some of the students that I taught are in the streets. And well, we've talked about it and we've, we've said that yes, they would like to have a, a higher democracy than, than what China is going to be offering them, which is, we'll tell you who your candidates are and you get a chance to vote for the ones we've selected for you. Um, but really, Hong Kong is all about status. And the mainland people coming in every day to buy the whole shelf of the Louis Vuitton purses. That's what Hong Kong is all about. Anything else to add? It's all about money. It's all about money. Yeah. And, um, um, what we don't really realize here in the States is how many of the business people, the tycoons, the, and, and, and the, the mainstream government people uh, want stronger ties with Beijing. They don't want to fuck Beijing. They don't think that Beijing is so, they don't have the reflexive kind of uh, 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 feelings that we have about it. They, 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 it's good for business. Beijing means for them, they, it unlocks all kinds of opportunities on the on the mainland, so it's a very complicated situation, and um, it's uh, uh, not going to go away anytime soon. I think we're ready for any questions that anybody might have. We're ready. Please. Uh, I'm interested in your publishing experience. You you started writing 
while you were in China, right? It started as a blog. It started as a blog. Yeah. Um, and and, 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 and in, in writing about like kind of harmless anodyne things, I would, I would write those coming home. Things about uh, shopping or things about uh, what happened when we ran out of uh, uh, water in our apartment. How did, we, how did we get help for that? But a lot of things I did not write about uh, while I was there and just saved them up. I, I didn't want uh, to write anything to deal that dealt with um, uh, my, my employer, my, my employment with, I, I not, f first of all, not to embarrass anybody, but also not to get anybody into any trouble. You never really could be sure whether anybody was actually reading your emails or not. Um, when we first got there, I was very paranoid that every move we made was being watched by somebody. <laughs> but after a while, I relaxed with that. I thought that that probably wasn't true. But that the chances of somebody sometime selectively looking at an email or two, that was possible. So no, there was uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the content of the book I did not dream about publishing till we got home because um, the controls were the controls were pretty strict. This is in the mainland. Uh, on the mainland, um, there were, there were there, there's a tremendous network of censors who are working all the time to tell the media what they can and cannot write. So even if we were writing on my very first day of the job. There was a story that I was working on about uh, a scandal that was going on in the local police department, in the Shanghai Police Department. Um, a judge had ruled against the police for being, uh, they'd been framing some people. And um, um, we were trying to write the second day story about this, about now uh, we're going to have this angle and this angle and this angle. The story is written, I'm putting it in together in the page, and then an editor comes over and says, Sorry, this has all been redone. The government doesn't like this. We're, we're reducing it down to, to this much. And I was, first of all, I'd never seen this before in my life, that before you write a story, the government is telling you what parts of it you can and cannot write. We'd never seen this. I mean, I mean what I was used to in 30-some years as an American reporter, newsman was, you write something, the authorities don't like it, they pick up the phone the next day and they, they scream at you. But they never dream of calling up your newsroom and saying you don't print that, unless it's the Pentagon Papers, in which case you go to the Supreme Court. I mean, it's very, very, very rare. So, but this, is, this was routine. I mean, the, 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 the only people that seemed ruffled by it were the couple of Americans who were in there. Um, and, but the staff was completely used to this happening all the time. I mean, it happened, and, 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 and they're, they're, they're Um, their criticism of what, uh, their pre-criticism of what we weren't supposed to write was so precise that I was pretty sure there had to be somebody in the newsroom who was a censor, who was looking at the stories going over our shoulder. But it turned out that that really wasn't true. It turned out that they were just, they just, they just sort of knew uh, from the, the feed of news what was likely to come up the next day. And what they said was, the government has made a s statement about this. We've had enough about it. Next subject. When the president of China, the rare occasions when he would get on and make a TV address, he'd make his address, and then bam, immediately right back to, you know, the game show. There was no reporter coming on to talk about what the president had said, let alone was there a whole network of people to go on and say what an idiot the president had been for saying what he had said. They just, it was just... There is no, there's no dissent. When uh, um, Leo Jaibo won the Nobel Peace Prize, a dissident who was in prison, uh, the Chinese papers on the mainland were not allowed to write about it. So everybody in the newsroom knows that Leo Jaibo has read this. It's, it's on all the world news. Our reporter, our, 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 our editors, though, were very cagey. They left, they knew that we couldn't write about Leo Jaibo wins Nobel Prize. But they left a space on the bottom of the main news page thinking that at some point in the evening, Xinhua, which the uh, Western wags called Shitwad, <laughs> the official news agency, would 
make some statement to the foreign press. And sure enough, uh, around 11 o'clock at night, they issued a statement in English meant for the, the rest of the world, not for their own audience, that was something along the lines of, uh, how dare Norway interfere with uh, China's domestic affairs by honoring this, this dissident? And I don't know, they were going to stop their, sh you know, they, were, they threatened to cut off their imports of salmon or something, you know, locks <laughs> or something, right? But they were, so we were able to write a, st uh, run a story that said, Norway, <laughs> you know, uh, 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 Beijing slams Norway for prize pick. And then, you know, in the third paragraph, we could say that they were reacting to the fact that Leo Jaibo had just won the, uh, the Nobel Prize. That's how our readers, who were the Westerners, of, uh, sold about 60, 70,000 copies of the paper a day. And they were, they were people who, foreigners who were in the country visiting, in the country working. About a third of the circulation were Chinese people who either wanted to practice up on their English or who thought that we were getting more news in our paper than normal, which was true because the censors, first of all, didn't read English that well, that quickly. And number two, um, they felt that, you know, it, uh, this is news that the foreigners are getting. We don't really care if the, we can't, we don't care if the foreigners' minds are poisoned. We just don't want, we don't want to sully the minds of our own people. When I went to Hong Kong, the reason, the main reason we went, I went, we went to Hong Kong is I had a job opportunity at the South China Morning Post, which is a kind of very serious newspaper. And they have freedom of the press in Hong Kong. They still have the freedoms that the British left behind, um, their own currency, their freedom of assembly, there's dissent that they don't have in the mainland. So we were able, this paper, in theory, was able to write all the stories about mainland China that the Chinese people themselves couldn't read. And sure enough, when I, when I was very happy to, very proud to be there, when, when it came time for Leo Jaibo's ceremony, and he went to Stockholm, and, 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 and the ceremony was held in Stockholm, and there was an empty chair to represent Leo Jaibo, because he was still in prison. The South China Morning Post, our paper, sent a reporter to Stockholm, basically for a week long of series of stories about the empty chair. And the empty chair was on the front page of this paper. Uh, the existence, the whole existence of this thing not being recognized or acknowledged um, by the millions upon millions of people reading the media and, and the mainland. But Which we're sure is happening right now with what's happening in Hong Kong. People in mainland China don't know, don't know about it at all. I did teach in, China, in Shanghai before we moved to Hong Kong. And I had some friends and uh, students, they, they knew nothing of their history. Nothing. Tiananmen Square, never heard of it. Amazing that the, the country, even now with all of the technology, uh, is still able to turn off the TVs. Uh, what, what did we find? The censorship on, on the computer? If we we would like once in a while test it. We'd write like something about Tiananmen Square, and then what, your the computer, computer shuts down for about twenty down. minutes. It's like someone's then the, watching you all the time. You better not mess up. Well, at least there were you know internet triggers, you know, to um, to, to, to flag certain words. Just in the last couple of weeks, they were used, one of the triggers became umbrella, because you know umbrella revolution. If you if you look for umbrella and you're in mainland China, there's a good chance that your computer is going to go uh, uh, go. Go blink, go blank. Question? Yeah. Is there any way that they can smuggle these newspapers in? They do. do they that? do that quite a bit. In fact, well, some of the there is most of the most of the the mainlanders who are coming into Hong Kong by the bus load and the and the boat load every day are there to shop, as Ellen says. But there are intellectual people who are coming in to pick up works, books, uh, magazines, newspapers that can't be had. Um, in the mainland to smuggle them back. And that happens a lot. Yes? Yeah, your picture carousel shows one with Obama in a Chinese outfit with red star on. I mean, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that was just a jokey thing that, uh, that they came up with, you know, like a souvenir shop thing. I mean, to, to make them look like a, um, uh, you know, like, 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 like a Maoist. Um, 
and it was just a joke. Mao is uh, is, so, is sort of is like kitsch to um, to in, in the tourist industry in um, in in China. You can pick up all kinds of Mao decks of playing cards and Mao um, you know shirts and things and and that was actually like a um, a, a form of uh, of affection. They liked Obama. The, the average people liked Obama. We were there. We had been only been there about a month or so when Obama, this was very fresh in Obama's presidency, and he made his first foreign trip. And that fir first foreign trip was to China. And the first place he lands is Shanghai. It was crazy because the hotel he was staying in was only about three blocks away from the newspaper office, the Shanghai Daily. And there was no excitement whatsoever. There were no crowds. There were no. We just kind of walked up to the hotel that day and just started talking to a couple of the security people. It was like it was so low key. The whole the whole thing it was really weird. They, nobody made any kind of fuss that Obama was coming. But then he lands and it's in the newspapers. And he made his first impression. And this told me more about the Chinese people in a way than it told me about Obama. He comes off the plane. It's a drizzle, and he's he's carrying his own umbrella. That was the headline in the Chinese media. When he came off the, when he came off the plane, the, the Chinese reporters first went up to a guy who was next to Obama, thinking that the guy with the umbrella could not be the president of the United States. <laughs> the leader does not hold his own umbrella. So they liked Obama right from the start, that he, had, that he was just folks, that he, you know, they, they couldn't, that he, he kind of blew their minds really fast. And it was very, very interesting because we saw all the press coverage that the New York Times and the Washington Post were sending back home. And it was kind of downbeat. It was like the, the, the Chinese didn't give him a warm reception, and uh, particularly, and he wasn't allowed to talk to this town hall group of people the way he wanted to and to bring up human rights concerns. And so they thought it was a kind of a downer, you know, like low failure. But in China, the the, the 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 it was upbeat. They thought that we had. Uh, first of all, they were very glad that we didn't have a George Bush anymore, <laughs> and they were they, and they liked this. They they, they liked the humility. They, they what they liked what they thought was this guy's humility, his his youth. When he went to the Great Wall, he was pictured at the Great Wall of China in a in a kind of a leather jacket and looking really youthful. And they liked Obama. I don't know what they think now, five years later. Oh, incidentally, we forgot to mention that this trip of ours this is a propitious weekend for us because this is five years almost to the day that we left for China. It was five years today that our middle son got married in Philadelphia. We had delayed, we had timed our trip to take off just two days after his, he got married. And it was five years ago. So all these events, the world has changed a lot in those, in those five years. Uh, but that T-shirt, that that T-shirt uh, is is one that uh, you know. In the in uh, if um, I suppose I, I suppose if uh, Fox News were to run that T-shirt, that would be ultimate proof that uh, that that Obama is a uh, is 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 a commie uh, traitor. Yeah, Chauncey, do you have a? Yeah, um, a little inside baseball. What apart from the. Um, Censorship and everything. What were the uh, news gathering and reporting operations like? Uh, what were the skills of the reporters compared to what you were used to here? Well, um, it, the, the biggest con the, the 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 reporting in Hong Kong, where it was a free and open press, was very similar to what you would expect to find in a any Western paper. But in in Shanghai, it was pure amateur hour, because uh, the reporters that they they hired were. Um, they were hired for the, 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 the first real prerequisite you needed was that you had to have some command, at least some modest command of English. Um, you didn't really need to have, have any real skills in journalism, and only maybe half the staff really had any real interest in journalism because there was no, there was no spirit of... Uh, Doing any kind of investigation whatsoever, you printed what the government agency handed out to you, and um, so they would. If if you were covering, uh, you know, the, the police and there was an accident, um, and uh, I, I you, you, they, they, the reporters then would go out to the scene or just wait for the uh, press release to come out. 
they'd translate it into English, they would hand it over to us polishers, we would try to figure out what, the, what, what, what it was they said. And then you would look at it and you'd say, well, what did the witnesses say? And the reporter would say, oh, we didn't talk to any witnesses. The, the, the police told us not to talk to anybody. So there were no, there, there were, there were no witnesses. Um, if you went to, uh, the, if, if there was a directive from the health department, you would say, well, this looks like exactly the same figure they had last week. Um, what, what, uh, what did they say about that? Oh, we didn't bother to ask any questions because we knew they wouldn't answer any questions. So there's, a, there were a couple of young reporters who had been, uh, they, they, they took their inspiration from, um, uh, Oh gosh, all kinds of American literature and, and Woodward and Bernstein, and they, 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 they knew American culture very well, and they wished that they could be running, they could be doing that, but it didn't exist in, in, in our paper in, in, in Shanghai. You're right in the back, Kristen. Sorry, no. Um, you were there as a journalist. I, I went to Shanghai, I think, about two, no, probably three years ago. Oh, cool. And just, just for a very, very short time. And, um, Everything that you're saying as far as, you know, the censorship and stuff, that's what I would have expected, kind of like, oh, this is what I know about, you know, life there. But I went from the business side of it, and I wondered how, how were you the expats that were there with businesses? It's a completely different, like you said, that they're, how, how did they feel about it? Here? Well, they had a completely different life. You want to talk about that a little, Elle, because you... Some of your, your, you, had, you had girlfriends who were in this world. They, they lived in a bubble. They, they, they lived in an expat kind of bubble. And it was a very different from what we were doing. Most you know of the people that I met that were my peers, by that I mean that they were Western, right. usually you know, a little bit older. And uh, the women that I met through the American Women's Association in Shanghai, they were called Tai Tais. And that's the, 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 the literal translation would be women who lunch. We were the the trailing spouses. And uh, the women had, um, had amazing uh, stories to tell. I mean, first of all, I, I felt immediately bo bonding with them because they were the ones that said yes. I mean, there are a lot of people, husband or wife, but usually the husband would say, I got this terrific business opportunity. The, our, our company is starting a branch in Shanghai and they want me to run it. And I would say probably more than 50% of the spouses would say, oh, you're out of your mind? I'm not doing that, you know, so-and-so's in very happy in soccer and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But everybody that was there said yes. So I, you were, or, already had, had a group of, of friends that had a little bit more comfort of being out of their comfort zone. And the Thai Thais, we, we, we'd get together and they would, they would tell me hilarious stories. Most of the husbands would work um, and travel. Shanghai being the, the main, like we had a friend who was with GM and, and they would have to go to all the outlying cities and they'd come home for the weekend in Shanghai. The women were home all week with the kids and they were all excited that the weekend was coming up and their husband was coming home. They were excited that they were going to be able to just sit in front of the TV and maybe get to watch some American sports or something like that. So there was this kind of a, a friction. And then there were, were problems that the Chinese culture, and I, and I can't make a blanket statement, but from what I heard from my Thai Thai girlfriends was that to be a good host in China would be not to just get these businessmen to have a nice meal, but it would be to have a nice meal and a nice evening afterwards with one of the ladies that they brought along for dinner. So if obviously the, the, that, that was uh, causing a, a great consternation with the women. And one woman that they, that they spoke about who had been tight in the group and was, wasn't there, I never met her, and they said, oh, Chinese takeout. I said, what? And they, they went to explain to me that that was that they, the expression they used when their husbands got involved with one of these ladies that they'd been introduced to through their business meetings. And this one woman was uh, left for this other person. So, but the most interesting thing that we found were that these people that were very middle class in the United States would go to 
China, and they would be on the package, which meant that when they were ready to move, instead of the six suitcases that we were allowed to bring with us, a, a big moving truck would go to their house. They would fill all of their possessions into a um, container. It would go on a ship, and a month or so later, it would be delivered to the apartment or the house that their company had arranged for them to have. There were, they, they lived in a bubble. They really didn't experience the day-to-day -day life of, of, of what it's like to live abroad. They had drivers, and uh, they had IEs, which are, are, it means auntie. It translates into auntie, but it's uh, a full-time, usually live-in maid for maybe $25 a week. And so, I mean, these, the, the women that I met didn't have full-time help, didn't have chauffeurs, didn't have all of the things that they had when they were in Asia. They were living in an, art, an artificial... Um, no, you mean in America they didn't in have In America, it. I'm sorry. Yeah. They, they, they were living in, a, in, an, in an artificial kind of environment, and yeah. they were not happy when <laughs> their husband's um, contract was up and they had to go back. A lot of them... They were telling us, you, you might need counseling when you go back to the United States. It's going to be a rough, rough re-entry. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answered your question about, about no, the businesses. No, as far as, you know, I mean, and that's what you were saying. That's the tug of, like, I think, I think the people there felt like, or some key people, like the, the local businessmen and stuff, they feel like their life is improving. They're all making lots of money. And even the general person on the street you know, but like you said, it's it's all about the money and the. In a way, I was like, oh, this is capitalism at its best in some senses, right? And but on the other hand, what is their life really like? Like you're saying, as far as censorship and and other things. You know, I think that uh, as long as their economy is on the upswing, and we we were there, um, it was double digit growth. I mean, yeah, it I was. You were going to say that you went into real estate. <laughs> I, mean, you I was like, oh, you didn't go. <laughs> You know, we <laughs> thought about it for about 10 minutes, but then realized how much, how much Mandarin you would need or Shanghainese you would need and how much... Uh, well, I did think about it in Hong Kong. Sotheby's is international, and I, you know, I talked with them. We actually went there with Taiwanese. With Our host was a Taiwanese, and all the Taiwanese want to get into there because they want to get into the mainland. Like, you see, they, they just right. see so much right. opportunity. Right. But uh, as, long as, as long as the economy is uh, s upward, uh, I think that the loss of liberties that we would chafe under uh, is, is not going to be a huge, huge problem. I think they'll be able to keep what they call social harmony under control. Is there a little flacker with giving, they're letting people even, share? Even though, um, even, even, though, even though a paper that was as controlled as the Shanghai Daily every day had stories of plenty of unrest in it, unrest going in in other cities besides Shanghai, we had story after story about huge scandals going on in Chongqing. A s Shanghai had 20 million people, one city. That's the state of Florida. Chongqing was even larger. The, 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 the cities are of unimaginable size. And when they have a bribery scandal or something, it's, that's also of unimaginable size. I mean, people, the fish, middle of, you know, a mayor making off with millions and millions of dollars somewhere. Um, and there were plenty of little riots all day, uh, all over the country, all the time, over lo little disputes. But, the, but nobody is questioning the, the central government as a whole. Uh, that might change if, because they've always, they've all, they're, they're, they're used to thinking of the government as being the father, telling, them, telling the kids what to do. There's a lot of mischief in trying to get around the father's rule, but nobody really ever tries to topple the father. If though, and so far, the father has known pretty much best because in the space of a generation, they've gone from a poverty society to this middle class society. But if that stalls or reverses, then, then I think the whole political picture might be up for question also into very embracing as far as for American culture as far, and as far as like psychology and then like all these like let's say a, a motivational speaker Tony Robbins Zig Ziglar all those kind of things they're very interested in the American psyche it's well they're certainly interested in they're certainly interested in um, 
a lot of American things. Everybody wants a car now, even though they just learned how to drive like 10 minutes ago and there, there aren't enough roads. Um, everybody wants to overeat and eat a lot of burgers and Kentucky Fried Chicken and they're seeing diseases that they never had before. They're seeing a lot of obesity, they're seeing um, diabetes, they're seeing things that you know, like, uh, are very reminiscent of America. So we, there, there, were, uh, there was sort of like time and again we saw them, and they're, and, 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 and they're frankly mocking um, our idea of democracy because when they look on the TV, they see these two parties that are screaming at each other and tearing each other down and the country not going anywhere. Not, while they are phew, building highways and subway systems and high-speed trains and new airports and so what's so good about them? You know, your democracy. It, it's it's kind of a, a lot of a lot of things got turned on their head when you were over there. Okay, we have time for one more question. Okay. Yes, please. Um, I missed the very beginning. I just wanted to ask you what newspaper you worked for before going over there and. Did you go there for a job that? I did, yeah. I'm, um, I'm a lifelong newspaper guy, and I uh, was working for my last job in the American newspapers at the Sun Sentinel, and uh, got laid off in 2009, along with a lot of other people. And uh, the opportunity came to do newspaper work of a sort um, in Shanghai, China, and off we went. And we didn't have a package. We went. Uh, we were. We were. We were. We were paid better than the average Chinese person, but certainly not. Uh, we, we weren't getting paid by GM. Um, or, so it was. And it the was next great year we moved to Hong Kong, South China Morning Post, which did not have censorship. So that was a different, different experience. Anyone and else? Asked uh, one gentleman sort of favored him. One last question, please. I keep on seeing like a blue toy guy. Looks like. Oh, that blue toy Hi guy? Hi Bo. Hi Bo. That, that was the mascot of the World Expo, the 2010 World Expo. What, you didn't go? <laughs> this, was, this was the largest World's Fair in history. Um, they, 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 they got over 70 million people to come to the World's Fair. And um, it lasted just six months. It had more countries and more pavilions and more acreage than any World's Fair ever. And it left a lot of, I mean, because in America, who, well, what's a World's Fair? When's the last time any, we don't have World, who needs them anymore? But it was, it was very, very, very interesting because most of the people that went were Chinese people. And for them, most of them, this was the closest they were ever going to get to foreign travel. More and more Chinese people are traveling all the time, but it still isn't the, Every day, you know, no, not everybody can do it the way we can in the West. So, um, if they were seeing a pavilion of France or England, th there there was one kind of fuzzy-looking building. England had this amazing pavilion that was made out of like porcupine needles, and um, or, or or Italy or, or or any place that was like the closest they were going to get to foreign travel. It was really very kind of touching to see so many people flocking to see these things and for Shanghai to show off. Like, Shanghai, by the way, wanted to show that it was, could put on a better international show than Beijing did two years earlier with its Olympics. <laughs> Big rivalry. Mm -hmm. Were you there during the fair? Sorry? Were you there? For the Absolutely. world, yeah, we went a number of times. Yeah, yeah, it was cool. Was it? Yeah, yeah. It was Epcot, but huger, much, yeah. much huger. If you, if you, the one thing you need to understand about China is the crowds. Mm -hmm. Just, it's, imagine uh, Times Square, New Year's Eve, and it's like that oh, no. in many cities <laughs> almost every day. The, there's pictures in here that just, it just jam-packed people all the time. So yes, that's what that's what the World's Fair was like. There would be like nine hour lines for the more popular pavilions. Oh and the, the, the people are, nine hours, yeah, that's all right. <laughs> the, the, everybody is used to it. Everybody is used to huge crowds and expectations of waiting. And uh, it's, it's just like that everywhere. If you don't like crowds, you really wouldn't be comfortable there. Just people, you know, the, the bubble that people have around themselves, it's mm -hmm. kind of, 
very small. Oh, that's right. We're, you know, we're used to a kind of a personal space, you know, like at least that large when you're in a, and there you get used to like people being like that. You know, it's like, it's like You've been there, we, you were, yeah, yeah. yeah. So thank you very much. You've really been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Howard. Thank you, Ellen. Um, for those of you who are here in the store, you can pick up your copy of the book. For those of you who are watching online, you can give us a call. We'll order it. I just also want to say that the, uh, the Goodman's next book is going to be in Chinese, but it's going to be translated from Swahili. So you want to pick that up. Thank you all so much for coming. The books are for sale. They'll be signing them right over here. Thank you so much for coming.